Are the rapture and the second coming the same thing? So let's look at the chart just for a minute. So if we consult the chart, the chart is going to tell us that the rapture occurs at the end of the dispensation of grace. So the last event of the dispensation of grace is the rapture. The second coming of Christ is a different event. It is an event later in time. It occurs at the end of the 70th week. And so if we just look at the chart, we know that the rapture and the second coming are not the same event. But let me pause there just for a second. The chart is a tool. It's a very helpful tool, but we want to always go by the Word of God and not by the chart. The chart is something that man created. Now, I, this is a great chart. I think it's an accurate chart. I use the chart all the time. I like the chart. But I don't prove things on the basis of the chart says so. You prove things on the basis of a verse. When, when Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things, he doesn't mean by the chart. He means by proving things, by comparing verse with verse. And so what we're going to study tonight is this. We're going to show you the differences between the second coming and the rapture. And to preview it, I'm going to tell you that there's four big differences. There's probably more than four, but there's four that I'm going to focus on tonight. The four big differences between the rapture and the second coming are, number one, the timing. Number two, the location. Number three, the people. And number four, the purpose. In other words, these two events take place at different times in different locations. They involve different people and they have a different purpose. So they're obviously not the same event. Now that's a preview. Let's see if that's what scripture says. So get with me Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 and we'll start there. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 verse 29. Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Very helpful introduction, isn't it? We know the exact timing. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So if we go to the tribulation and go immediately after it, that's the context. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now, some will say that the events of the gospel, such as Matthew 24, they will say that all of those events were fulfilled during the first century. But that just it can't be the case. So look at what 29 says. The sun will be darkened, and they'll say, well, you know, there was an eclipse for a little while. Well, the sun's not darkened. You can just go out during the day, and the sun obviously shines. And the moon shall not give her light. Well, the moon is still here giving her light. And then notice this, even if you explain away those two. And the stars shall fall from heaven. Well, has that happened yet? It hadn't occurred. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So this is obviously a future event that hasn't taken place. And we know that it's immediately after the tribulation. Now notice verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So let's make sure we understand what verses 29 and 30 just told us. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, so this is after the 70th week, what happens? The sun is darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. 
So think about that just for a minute. If all those things happen, what does space look like? Well, it's dark, right? If the sun is darkened, so it's not giving light, and the moon doesn't give light, and the stars fall from heaven, what's left? Darkness. So Matthew 24, 29 describes events after the tribulation where the heavens become dark. And then what did verse 30 tell us? And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. So first the heavens go dark, and then there's a sign of the Son of Man. So let me ask you this question. How many people on earth are going to notice these events? Well, this isn't a local event. This isn't something that happened in your neighborhood. This is the sun was darkened. The moon didn't give light. The stars fell. Everyone on earth will notice when that happens. And then immediately after that happens, there's the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. In other words, guys, I'm coming. Could I make it more clear? I turned off the sun, turned off the moon, turned off the stars. I put a sign. I'm coming. That, that's what the Lord is doing in Matthew 24, verse 29. And then verse 30 specifically says, And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. It's the second coming. So the second coming has to be immediately after the tribulation, and it's after all of these disturbances in the heaven that make it clear that something is about to happen, and the sign of the Son of Man reveals it. Now that's the second coming. Let's now talk about the rapture. Get with me 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Scripture does not use the word rapture. The word rapture is a Latin word, originally appeared in the Latin Vulgate. Uh, it's not a word that you will find in the King James Bible, but it is a word that people commonly use. You will find in, in the scriptures terms like the adoption, to wit the redemption of our body. You'll see things about the glorious appearing. You'll see things about the blessed hope. So there's other terms that describe this event. We're going to use the term rapture just because it's a common term that people are familiar with. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, people differ about this, so you should study it for yourself, and you should dis decide what conclusion you believe the Scriptures teach. But what 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says is, God hath not appointed us to wrath. The 70th week, the tribulation, is a time of wrath. So, let's put two and two together. If God did not appoint the body of Christ to wrath, and the 70th week is a time of wrath, guess what? You need to not be here. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 establishes the pre-tribulational nature of the rapture. In other words, what does pre mean? Pre means before. So the rapture occurs pre-tribulationally. In other words, before the tribulation. And it occurs before the tribulation because Scripture says the body of Christ is not appointed to wrath. So are you going to be here during the 70th week? Not if you're a member of the body of Christ, you're not. So the first proof that the rapture is pre-tribulational is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. Now let me give you a second proof. Now what I'm going to do here is you can see the full chart. What I'm going to do is I'm going to modify it. And what I'm doing is I'm hiding the dispensation of grace. 
So the dispensation of grace does not appear on this chart. Now, I want you to think through something with me just for a minute. The dispensation of grace is described as a mystery. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7 tells us that a mystery is hidden wisdom. And in fact, let's just get Ephesians 3 9. Let's look at it together because it's it's better just to see it with your own eyes than to have me tell you about it. So look with me in Ephesians 3. And let's look at verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. And you can see a parenthesis there in verses 3 and 4. Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known. So let's put that all together. Paul was given the dispensation of grace. It's described as a mystery. And verse 5 says, in other ages it was not made known. So, was it made known to Adam, to Abraham, to Moses, to David, to John the Baptist, to Isaiah, to Jeremiah, to Peter? It wasn't made known to any of them because in other ages it was not made known. Now I'm going to hide this again. If you stood in Acts 7 as Stephen, and someone said to you, draw me the timeline of history, this is how it would be drawn, because the mystery had not yet been revealed. The mystery was a secret. Now get with me 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52 refer to the catching up. They refer to the rapture. And verse 51 specifically says it is a mystery. So now think about that. If the rapture is a mystery, and we know from First Corinth, from Ephesians 3 that the mystery revealed to Paul was hid from ages and it was not made known in time past, then if you put yourself in time past, you don't know anything about the rapture because it is a mystery. It hasn't been revealed yet. Now think about that just for a minute. What that tells you is the rapture has to occur during the dispensation of grace. It can't occur during the prophetic time calendar because it is a mystery. See, if you're in the Old Testament and you're reading the Old Testament carefully and you read Daniel, Daniel tells you about the 70th week. Isaiah tells you about the millennium. You can know about these events of prophecy because they're revealed in the Old Testament. And in fact, you can see all the verse references here. You can look those up and, and see those in the Old Testament. They knew all about it. But they didn't know about the mystery because the, the mystery was hidden. And they didn't know about the rapture because the rapture is a mystery. Now, what all that tells you is the rapture, therefore, must take place during the dispensation of grace. In fact, it's the last event of the dispensation of grace. Get with me 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now this one, you're going to need to put on your thinking cap, and I think this will this will help you. 2 Timothy 2, verse 17. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Now notice verse 18. Who concerning the truth have erred. So they've made a mistake. What's their mistake? 
saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Well, when they err and they say the resurrection is past, which resurrection are they talking about? Are they talking about the resurrection of the Lord at the end of the Gospels? Well, they're not talking about that. Are they talking about the resurrection of people into the Millennial Kingdom? They're not talking about that. What resurrection are they talking about? They're talking about the resurrection that occurs at the rapture. What happens at the rapture is all of those members of the body of Christ who are dead, they are resurrected. They get their new bodies at that time. Now what 2 Timothy 2.18 is describing there is there is a false teaching that the resurrection is past. The resurrection that's being described there has to be the rapture, and I'll prove it to you. Are you ready? If it's talking about the resurrection at the second coming, you would be in the kingdom. The Lord would be present. It's not something where that can be passed and you not know it. Once the second coming happens and people are resurrected, everyone on earth is going to know it. The Lord is going to be visibly reigning. But the nature of the rapture is that the rapture occurs and the only people that leave the earth are the body of Christ. You know what that means? Life on earth continues to some degree business as usual. Let me put it this way. At the rapture, does 99% of the earth's population leave? 85 70? 50? You realize that when the rapture occurs, the vast majority of the people are still going to be here. So what 2 Thessalonians 2.18 tells you is when there was this false teaching that people missed the resurrection, it's a reference to a pre-tribulational rapture because that's the only thing you can miss. You can't miss the second coming if the, if the rapture was, in fact, at the same time of the second coming, you couldn't miss that. How are you going to miss that when the sun turns to darkness? You, you're not going to be able to miss that. See, what 2 Thessalonians 2.18 does is it confirms that the rapture is pre-tribulational. So the first and most basic reason that we know that the rapture and the second coming are different events is they occur at very different points in time. They're literally years apart. They're in fact more than seven years apart because there is, there's a time lapse, there's a gap between the rapture and the start of the 70th week. If the rapture occurs on Monday, the 70th week doesn't start on Tuesday. There's, there's, there's other prophetic events that take place. What that tells you is the rapture and the second coming are different events. They're, they're, they differ by years and years. So they're not the same event. The second difference is the location of the Lord's coming. So get with me Zechariah 14. Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14. Zechariah chapter 14. Notice with me verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Zechariah 14 is a prophecy about the day of the Lord coming. Now notice what it says in verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Now notice what that is saying. And by the way, before we dig into verse 4, where did the Lord ascend from? 
he ascended from the Mount of Olives. So if you, if you read early Acts, after the Lord died on the cross, was buried and rose again the third day, he subsequently ascended into heaven, and he ascended from the Mount of Olives. What Zechariah 14 is describing is the second coming. So let's hide the dispensation of grace again. The Lord leaves the earth at the ascension. He leaves from the Mount of Olives, and at the second coming, he returns to the earth. And where does he return? He returns to the exact same place he left. He returns to the Mount of Olives. Now notice what Zechariah 14 verse 4 says. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. So does the Lord come down and hover in the air 20,000 feet before the Mount of Olives, above it? Or does he return and his feet actually set foot? They touch the Mount of Olives. And Zechariah 14 says that they literally touch the Mount of Olives. Look with me at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And let's, let's start in verse 14. For if we, uh, let's do verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. This is how you think about deceased members of the body of Christ. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. So this is the Lord returning from heaven. Shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now notice verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Well, where do we meet the Lord? According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We meet the Lord in the air air. What happens in 1 Thessalonians 4 is the Lord does not come all the way down to the Mount of Olives because it's not the second coming. He comes down to the Mount of Olives at the second coming and there's a valley formed because it's the second coming and all of the wrath described in prophecy is going to occur at that time. But what 1 Thessalonians refers to is it refers to us meeting the Lord in the air. We meet him in the clouds because we're not coming back to the earth. We're going to heaven. The reason I know that the body of Christ goes to heaven, get with me 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, what happens if your body gets disintegrated? I mean, there are, there are members of the body of Christ where, obviously there's members of the body of Christ that die. There's members of the body of Christ where their body is just completely destroyed, right? Because of something that happens to them. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands. And where is it? Eternal in the heavens. So as a member of the body of Christ, where will you be for eternity? You will be in the heavens, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 says so. What the Lord does at the rapture is he comes down to the earth's atmosphere. He doesn't come down to set his feet on the ground. He comes down to the earth's atmosphere. The, the, the members of the body of Christ are caught up. We meet him in the air and we go to heaven because that is our eternal dwelling place. So the second reason that the second coming and the rapture are different events is they take place in different locations. At the rapture, the Lord meets his body of Christ. The, those deceased members of the body of Christ he brings with him, and those that are alive and remain are caught up to meet him in the air. That occurs 
in the earth's atmosphere. That occurs in the first heaven. Zechariah 14 describes the second coming where the Lord's feet stand on the, the Mount of Olives. So what's the third difference? Well, the third difference is the people that are involved. So look with me at Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19. And look with me at verse 11, Revelation 19, 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Revelation 19, 11 is a reference to the second coming. It's a reference to the Lord being in heaven, the heavens opened. He's faithful and true, and what he's going to do is in righteousness, he's going to judge and make war, meaning he's going to return to earth, and he's going to pour out his vengeance on his adversaries. Look with me at verse 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. No question that this is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him. First Thessalonians 4 didn't mention anything about armies at the rapture. But there's armies that follow the Lord at the second coming because he's returning to make war. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Verse 15, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. What the Lord is doing at the second coming is he returns to earth, and he's going to set up his millennial kingdom but what is the first thing he does before setting up the millennial kingdom? He pours out wrath on his adversaries. The Lord Jesus Christ establishes his millennial kingdom not through an election. There is no vote. The earth did not take a vote and say, we all voted, we're agreed, we want the Lord Jesus Christ to reign. That's not what happens. He returns and his enemies oppose his return. He brings the armies of heaven with him. The sharp sword goeth out of his mouth because what he's going to do is those that oppose him being king of kings are going to be destroyed. Revelation 19, what happens at the second coming is the Lord comes and he comes and his first order of business is to pour out vengeance on his adversaries. Compare that, get with me 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians Chapter 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Notice what it says. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Is the rapture about the Lord's enemies, or is it about his beloved saints? It's about his saints, is what it's about. Verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. See, the reason I say that the second coming and the rapture involve different people, the second coming is the Lord returning to deal with his adversaries, and he's going to destroy them. They're going to be crushed. The rapture is the Lord coming for his own. 
Let me say that as a word of encouragement. If, if you look out at life and the earth and you think everything is crazy, uh, it is. That's true. But you know what? What's going to happen is the Lord is going to return for the body of Christ. And if this world frustrates you, if you find this world difficult, well, you're going to be delivered from it because you're going to meet the Lord in the air and you're going to be ever with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.1 says, eternal in the heavens. Verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Now the fourth difference between the second coming and the rapture is the purpose. And we, we touched on this briefly, but let me just make this clear. The purpose of the second coming is for the Lord to return, to pour out vengeance on his adversaries, and establish his millennial kingdom on the earth. The Lord's millennial kingdom will literally be on the earth. He will sit in Jerusalem, and he will reign, and he will govern on earth the earth. The purpose for the rapture is for the Lord to receive the body of Christ, the, the members of the body of Christ who were saved during the dispensation of grace. They will be received unto him, and he will take them to heaven where they will be forever. In other words, the rapture and the second coming have fundamentally different purposes. The rapture is about the body of Christ. The rapture is about the body of Christ going to heaven to be in the heavens forever. The second coming is about the Lord returning to establish his kingdom on the earth. So let me tie this all together. People ask the question, are the rapture and the second coming the same event? And what happens sometimes is there's verses that talk about the Lord coming. And so they say, well, it's, it's the same thing. It's the Lord coming. There's only one of them. Well, that's not the case. And the reason it's not the case is these events take place at different periods of time. They're years removed in, in time. They occur in different locations. They involve different people, and they have different purposes. So the rapture and the second coming are plainly not the same event.